All right, so today's our great pleasure to have Professor David Carré with us. Uh, David started his career at the College de France, and he is currently a professor at the uh, PMMH Ladex Labs. He's a recipient of many prestigious awards, uh, among those uh, CNR Silver Medal. Uh, David has a broad research interest in fluid mechanics, mostly around superhydrophobicity, self-propulsion, impacts, liquid depositions, and of course, droplets, that is also the topic of his talk today. Uh, last thing, uh, before I forget, all the these JFM papers of the last 10 years are now freely available. Please have a look at JFM website. And with all this being said, it's truly a pleasure to have you, David. Much looking forward to your talk and flow is all yours. Okay, so uh, thanks. Thanks for uh, this, uh, this invitation. It's, uh, it's extremely nice to be uh, connected to uh, this uh, holy place uh, uh, in science at large, in fluid mechanics in particular. Uh, of course, today it's broader than just Cambridge, but uh, it's always uh, a fantastic opportunity to go there. And of course, I'm a bit sad today not to be the pilgrim I used to be, uh, taking a boat and the horses, and after a few days being in this, uh, fabulous place today. It's modern times, uh, it's different, but the pleasure is that uh, I can meet uh, many of you who are also like me today uh, um, abroad. So what I'm going to discuss is uh, the acrobatics of nonstick droplets, a kind of uh, nonstick droplets, uh, the one we, we, which are related to what is called the water repellent uh, material. And uh, I will cite uh, a few names from uh, our uh, former uh, and present students, but I will uh, insist maybe on uh, two names, uh, Timothée Mouterde and Pierre Lecointre, uh, two fabulous uh, PhD students we, we had uh, in our lab, and also uh, very nice collaborations with Antonio Kekko at that time at Brookhaven, uh, Gail Luke from uh, Thales, industry and Ioannis uh, Papa Constantinou from UCL. Good. So, uh, well, uh, uh, I'm not so young, I, I must confess. And so uh, as a consequence, the first date I must uh, introduce is more than 20 years ago. It was the first time uh, I saw uh, what I call today a nonstick drop. Uh, it was a cover of uh, Longmuir. Uh, and it was a Japanese paper, and the object was looking obviously fabulous. Uh, I was in a lab at that time, uh, Mazi uh, mentioned it, which was uh, Physique de la matière condensée at Collège de France, and every, everybody there was inter were interested in mainly in uh, creeping flows, uh, uh, spreading drops, uh, liquids very close to solids at a molecular scales and so on, and suddenly we had a completely different uh, object, which was the opposite object. Instead of having a wetting object, we had a nearly pure non-wetting object, something that I liked immediately to call a pearl. And when you look at this very simple picture, you realize that uh, the, the life of this drop should be extremely different from what it is usually. And this is exactly what allows it to perform some uh, uh, acrobatic uh, movements. So, uh, of course, a first consequence, we guess immediately from the, from the appearance of this drop, is a mobility. Uh, imagine that you place it on a tilted plate. Uh, as soon as you do that, uh, the drop will move, and it will move extremely quickly. So these two facts are very unusual. Uh, so quickly that here uh, we have to take uh, uh, 18,000 uh, frames per second to capture the movement of the drop. And if the solid is polluted, the drop takes with it uh, all the contaminants. Uh, in this particular case, it was pepper on a lotus leaf. And Bartlott, a very famous German botanist, coined the, the expression of lotus effect to speak about these uh, self-cleaning uh, possibilities. What is unusual here is not the fact that the water is taking the pepper. Uh, it has just to do with uh, surface tension, the fact that you lower surface energy when you stick particles at the at a liquid surface, in particular at the water surface. 
uh, it is a fact that the liquid is extremely mobile. And what is very nice with these uh, water repellent material is the fact that many things which are generally viscous uh, are inertial here, which means that if you go to viscous liquids, you keep very interesting properties uh, very often. For instance, in this very simple experiment, which is a Galilean experiment of a tilted plate, where you place very viscous drops instead of, of having uh, water, let's say glycerol, uh, uh, seen from the top now, uh, when they are moving down, uh, first thing, they are moving down, and when they are moving down, the dynamics are extremely unusual. The fact that the little one beats the big one is obviously very unusual. And it has to do with a very poor contact this drop has with the substrate. Uh, Mahadevan and Pomo, again, long ago, this is uh, the basics of my story, um, uh, showed that uh, this contact is quadratic in size instead of being uh, linear in size as it is in regular wetting. And this non-linearity generates um, this uh, extremely curious thing that little objects move faster in the viscous limit, which is absolutely remarkable. When you go to viscous limit, of course, you expect that the reduction in size uh, should be dramatic in the sense that the viscous effect should be uh, more and more dominant. And this is not uh, exactly what is observed, as you could see. Uh, well, uh, of course, all of that is very unusual. If you take a regular solid now, and you place a few drops on this regular solid when it is tilted, uh, when the size is, let's say, a few millimeters, then uh, it stays uh, stuck on the solid. And uh, when it is large enough, of course, gravity uh, beats surface tension, and you see a movement. But this is a real-time movie. This movement is slow. And so both adhesion and friction are very uh, spectacular in a sense. Water does not flow, and when it flows, it flows slowly. And all of that has to do with contact line. So the fact that we have a contact line which can pin on the defect of the solid on the one hand, and the fact that we have a special uh, viscous dissipation close to the contact line when the liquid is moving, which enhances the classical uh, viscous friction so that uh, the liquid uh, is slow. In this particular case, uh, one centimeter per second instead of, let's say, one meter per second for a river on a slope which is comparable. So we have, of course, uh, very special effects related to the contact line. And very naively, uh, when we are facing uh, this very beautiful liquid pearl, we can say to the first order, well, we suppress the contact line. So we expect very unusual things, a very uh, highly reduced adhesion and a highly reduced uh, friction. So how can we make these objects? Uh, very simply, and the recipe is, is, is famous, you take a solid, uh, and you place on this solid defects, a uh, texture. Uh, I don't say anything at the moment on, on the shape, uh, on the scale of the texture. I don't say anything because it's very broad. Many, many scales work, uh, many uh, shapes work. Uh, the only thing is that your solid is also coated by something which is hydrophobic. So a layer of wax, for instance, uh, or um, in a more sophisticated way, a silane, uh, that is a molecule which uh, brings uh, hydrophobic properties. And when a drop is coming to this uh, solid, uh, obviously you have at least two possibilities. Uh, one where the liquid does not penetrate the texture, uh, in which case you sit on a, a little bit of solid, very typically 10% of solid, and a lot of air, 90% of air, uh, so that you explain immediately two things which are absolutely essential. The first one is the sphericity of the object, because of course you are nearly on a cushion of air, and so you are nearly spherical. And the second thing is that uh, since uh, water cannot stick on air, you expect that uh, the pinning will be highly reduced. A little bit on the pillars, of course, but much less than on a regular solid where the contact is really a genuine contact between the solid and the liquid. Conversely, if your liquid penetrates the texture, then you are obviously in a state which should be much more sticky. And uh, in, uh, uh, as a very simple uh, conclusion of all of that, 
we are looking for the situation where you realize this uh, kind of uh, levitation. So once we do that, uh, and in, in the first example I showed, this is uh, the case, uh, we can generate uh, what is called a high degree of hydrophobicity, but this hides many possibilities. And uh, uh, we can define these possibilities as functions. You have a solid like that, and you want to do a, a special property, a specific property, which has to do with water probably, uh, but not only, and uh, which exploits this uh, 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 kind of levitating state. So the first function, which is extremely easy to achieve, uh, just a regular texture plus uh, hydrophobicity, is the anti-rain function. So the water is coming as drops with some impact velocity, and when it does that on such a solid, uh, you observe something which is now very classical, a spreading due to inertia, and then uh, recoiling of your liquid, and very, very beautiful, uh, if I quote Shakespeare, water is so full of shapes in this particular case, and we see many of these successive shapes. At some point, the water disappears at the top, but obviously it will come back. It will come back with these vibrations. It will come back slower also because the uh, initial height is smaller, but the, the result when it comes back is more or less the same, uh, a little bit of spreading, less of course, and recoiling and taking off. So this is a very nice practical property, of course, because uh, well, your solid remains dry after a rain. And as I said earlier, this is really a very inertial uh, behavior. It looks a little bit like a spring. And as a consequence, the effect of viscosity is relatively poor. Uh, in, our, in, in our lab, very recently, Aditya Jha, a PhD student, uh, a very brilliant one, uh, looked at this situation when you increase the viscosity. So this is, this is viscosity of water. And so you have this exchange between kinetic energy and surface energy. And of course you expect that when you increase the viscosity of the liquid, you should gradually damp uh, these oscillations and this, uh, this, uh, recoil this recoiling effect. But it's a case only at very high viscosity. This is nearly 100 times the viscosity of, of, of water. And it still, it, it still bounces very decently a few times. Uh, of course, oscillations are damped, but which is logical. And you can describe all of that with a very classical spring equation where you add a little term, which is this term of viscosity. And this term, of course, you can make it larger and larger. And this is just the limit uh, where you reach uh, uh, the, 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 the limit of, of taking off. And as you can see, it corresponds to typically the viscosity of oil used for cooking. So it's really a viscous liquid. So uh, this is, uh, is anti-rain, even anti-viscous rain, as you can see. You can generate other functions. A second one, uh, which is very uh, spectacular, is uh, anti-oil, or let's say differently, anti-degraded uh, water. Uh, water with uh, surfactants, for instance, or water with alcohol, in which case you reduce a lot surface tension. And so uh, if you design very special texture, so now I'm going to say a few things about the shape of the texture, then it, it matters. Then there is a possibility, even in this particular case for hexadecane or tetra tetradecane to stop the liquid when it comes to contact with this solid because the contact line uh, can find a position uh, just below the top of this uh, kind of uh, mushroom. Uh, uh, and uh, because you have these overhangs, you can uh, uh, find a possibility to preserve the existence of air below this drop. So of course, the contact angle now is, is slightly larger because you, you have this, uh, this uh, contact with this mushroom uh, and also because uh, the contact with the mushroom is now favored. The genuine contact angle is um, um, acute in this, in this particular example so that um, uh, it's, it's more difficult to reach sphericity. However, it seems that this was exploited in nature. Uh, this discovery by Tuteja is uh, 2007, as you can see. Uh, at that time, we could say, well, this is one example where people find something which was not existing in nature, but it did. 
and Christoph Nainwis from the uh, Botanic Garden of Dresden uh, found fabulous texture at the surface of Colombola, which are these uh, little animals. They are not, not even insects, they are nothing. Uh, nobody knows how to classify them. They are blind. They live in the soil of very humid forest. Uh, so they are exposed to highly degraded water, water containing natural surfactants, containing alcohol. And this particular carapace is not wet by even pure alcohol. And the reason is that uh, you have all these overhangs, sub sub very subtle shape, and at a scale which is absolutely amazing. This is a little bit like in a fairy tale. You have a monster, and if you look carefully at the monster, you discover that he has a fabulous dress, and so probably this monster is a princess, actually. So this is my second example of a function. So the third function is, is anti-oil. The third example, maybe I will insist a little bit on it because uh, it's both very, very simple, but uh, it generates a large variety of situations. And it has to do with the fact that if you say that a liquid uh, is repelled by a solid, it's absolutely equivalent to say that the third phase, which is very neutral here, which is air, is attracted by this solid. So the, in, in terms of contact angle, the contact angle of the air on the, on the, on the solid in an environment made of water is uh, close to zero or even zero. And so uh, you can uh, see that in different ways. So this is an experiment by Hélène de Malprade where she looked at air bubbles, so uh, in water. And so the trick is to take a repellent surface and to immerse this repellent surface in the liquid. So the ceiling of the box here is made of this repellent solid. And the bubble is going to, of course, to, to rise. Uh, it bounces because it's difficult to evacuate the film of water. Everything is in water. But at some point, you make a contact. And when you make a contact, you have a very, very sudden spreading. And uh, the spreading is not a surprise. You could predict that. But the kinetics of this spreading is very unusual. It's extremely fast. At the scale, which is here of one centimeter, uh, the kinetic of spreading is, uh, uh, or the typical time scale, is 10 milliseconds. And so it's three or four orders of magnitude smaller than the reverse situation of water spreading on a solid. And the reason is relatively obvious, we could say. It has to do with the fact that the viscosity of air, of course, is very small compared to that of water. There is a factor of 100. And so as a consequence, uh, the friction here is not limited by viscosity as it is generally in a spreading phenomenon, but by the fact that you have to display the water which is around. So this is one first example, and uh, this is also exploited in nature. You have many insects or spiders uh, who, uh, who, I don't know which, they or that, I don't know how to say that in English, but they, they hide in, in water when they want to escape a predator, and they are coated by a, a, a carapace which is uh, water repellent, and as a consequence, when they enter uh, water, they are uh, surrounded by a plastron of air and they can uh, find oxygen for, let's say, 20 minutes, typically, uh, before uh, going out of the, of the pond where they are hiding. So this, uh, of course, uh, raise, uh, um, raises a very interesting question, uh, which is when an object is immersed in water, uh, it takes with it air, uh, and uh, this is, of course, extremely reminiscent of the famous landau levitch uh, coating uh, device, except that everything is upside down, okay? It's a non-wetting uh, liquid now, and air is coming. Air has some viscosity, and so very naturally, air is entrained, and uh, you can show that this is indeed a landau levitch process. In this particular experiment by Martin Kou, uh, you wait a little bit, air is going up, and on this particular shape, which is a conical shape, you see the bubble which is formed, which is topped by the fact that it's a cone. And so as a consequence, you can analy analyze the volume of this air bubble and deduce the thickness of the film. And so you can really describe uh, the things uh, in a quantitative way. But uh, I should uh, rather stress here the fact that, uh, again, uh, this is very nicely uh, exploited in, uh, in nature. A third example of this 
aerophilicity, the fact that these surfaces are aerophilic when uh, they are um, uh, underwater, uh, was found recently uh, at MIT by Burian and Panchanathan. They did a very, very clever experiment, which consists of depositing on, on these repellent surfaces water, so everything is fine, except that this water is sparkling water. So it contains uh, gas, which is carbon dioxide in this particular case. And of course, the question is uh, what, what's happening. In particular, you have two contradictory effects. On the one hand, these uh, little bubbles want to rise because of buoyancy. But if they contact the solid, they should spread on the solid. And indeed, uh, these drops are found to be levitating because you build a cushion of vapor below, which corresponds to the spreading of this carbon dioxide. And it's very visible that they are levitating. They are extremely mobile without any, any particular action. And you can even see colors here, which have to do with the fact that this layer uh, of gas is extremely thin. And they could, they could prove that in a very, very elegant way by taking a transparent superhydrophobic surface and looking from below. And so when the liquid is coming, you see beautiful fringes. And so you see the film of air. You can deduce the thickness of the film of air. And this movie is accelerated. And after some time, of course, you, you do not have any more gas. The gas is evacuated by the weight of the liquid. And so at some point, uh, the uh, contact is restored between this uh, levitating liquid and, and the solid. And then you build something which is a classical drop of water on a, a very hydrophobic solid, which you cannot guess from here because this is seen from below. Uh, but the reason is that there is no more any, any gas in your, in your liquid. So this is very reminiscent of the Leiden Frost effect, except that the levitation is not induced by the temperature of the substrate, but by the gas it contains. And because this gas is spreading on, on, on these kind of solids, then you can uh, generate this uh, very uh, clever thing. A final example on this very uh, high degree of aerophilicity, uh, is provided by this uh, uh, beautiful example taken from the research of David Yu uh, at Georgia Tech. Uh, he is interested in ants, and in particular in the way ants are uh, trying to, uh, to survive when there is a big flood, so typically on the Amazon River, for instance. And so they make a ball uh, uh, with their bodies. And so this is a ball of ant on water. And uh, it's not the Amazon River, it's, uh, it's in Atlanta, it's in the lab of David Yu. Uh, but uh, you see that the, they are textured and the fact that they are all together, they are very textured. And so they are very repellent and clearly they are aerophilic, which is a very nice thing in this particular case. And you can see below, you see it's shining because even under this pressure, uh, clearly uh, uh, it resists. By the way, uh, some clever ants here realize that there is a dry channel, and so <laughs> they don't only trust that the collective effect is, uh, is, is uh, uh, the only solution, uh, and they, they are escaping. So this uh, aerophilicity is a nice thing, and uh, I think that uh, we should all also have some interesting uh, uh, stories about that. Some people, for instance, discuss this very interesting question of the friction of objects which are immersed in water plus a layer of, of air, which is relatively stable because of the material. Uh, and so uh, how can you reduce the friction of this object when you move it in water? These are very beautiful questions, obviously. So I try to delay a little bit um, uh, the, the, the moment when I come to my main topic, because generally when we uh, we uh, scientists come to our main topic. Uh, it is the beginning of the boring part of a seminar. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, it has to do with the fourth function I would like to discuss, uh, which is the anti-fogging effect. So the possibility to repel water, which seems relatively easy to do, but not as, at the scale of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, one millimeter or even one centimeter or even larger in the case of the, the ants here, but at the scale of the dew, uh, which is, let's say, let's say 10 micrometers. And uh, of course, the textures themselves can be at the scale of uh, 10 micrometers. So we guess that this is uh, extremely 
uh, challenging. However, there, there was uh, about 10 years ago, this very beautiful experiment in the group of uh, Chua Hua Chen at Duke University, where under a microscope, he saw the coalescence of two tiny drops. So the typical size here can be uh, 20 micrometers maybe. And uh, they are mobile enough uh, to take off when they coalesce, okay? And this little drop is coming back. And when it comes back very nicely, it bounces. So this means here that without any source of external energy, there is a possibility to exploit the fact that when dew is forming, uh, little drops appear, they grow, uh, at some point they coalesce. And if the mobility of these drops is large enough, if you are able to keep this property uh, at the scale of these tiny drops, then there is a self-evacuation of the dew. <laughs> and at the time of COVID, when we have our mask and glasses, uh, we realize that uh, this is a very interesting effect to have a surface which is uh, genuinely uh, anti-foggy. Chen uh, also noted a very, very stimulating uh, discovery that uh, the wings of the cicada uh, have such a property. And when you look at the texture at, on, on these wings, uh, you see something which is uh, very particular. Uh, first thing, it's ex extremely small. So the size of the texture is 100 nanometers. So very, very small compared to most texture you, we find uh, in the labs and we find in, uh, in, in, in natural examples. The second thing is that the texture is much simpler than many uh, of uh, the texture that we uh, generally uh, see in, in the natural world. It consists of cones. So we, we have, uh, well, this question, which is, uh, is it interesting to make a texture at the scale of 100 nanometers? Uh, does it bring new properties? And the second question is, uh, does the shape matter? So we have two questions here, which are, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, extremely interesting. So more or less at the same time, um, some um, excellent colleagues who are also uh, formidable competitors uh, in the group of Evelyn Wong uh, at MIT, uh, did this beautiful experiment where more systematically uh, they took uh, materials and they brought these materials at a temperature which is a few degrees, let's say four degrees, five degrees um, uh, Celsius, of course, uh, and uh, they look at the condensation of the atmospheric water, okay, and so this is a top view, and so you are going to see uh, little drops which are appearing at a scale which is now smaller and smaller, okay, and in this particular case, uh, the solid is made of nano needles, so the size effect is there, 100 nanometers, even less in diameter, and the shape effect is a bit different, they are very elongated. And so when they do this experiment, look here first, uh, you see these little dots, these are tiny drops of water, they coalesce, but they don't leave here. And then they coalesce again, they don't leave. Look here, here, it's slightly longer, so we have two drops here, and they leave, okay? And here, they coalesce, and they don't leave. So it happens. And in this particular movie, when you analyze this movie, it happens relatively often, that they are leaving, that they are departing. Uh, the uh, probability that they depart when they merge is about um, one third, okay? Which is, which is, which is, uh, which is uh, of course, a very interesting number. So uh, this is very unusual. When you take regular texture, uh, 10 micrometers, you, you cool that to four degrees, five degrees. You look at the condensation of that atmospheric water you see all these black dots, they are growing, and then they merge, and uh, gradually they are uh, larger and larger, of course, uh, and obviously none of them is leaving the solid. So this is the usual case, of course. This is a case uh, we are used, even in the case of a, a water repellent material, uh, which is a regular one, uh, the scale of the texture and the, the shape of the texture are regular ones, it does not leave, and you even see that the drop is heavily pinned inside the texture, which looks very logical because, uh, of course, you build the drop from the bottom. And so you expect 
to be in this highly sticky state that I mentioned at the very beginning. So now, uh, well, we, we know uh, where we are. Uh, there is a possibility to observe departing drops, which is, uh, of course, very interesting and very stimulating. Uh, and we uh, guess from the natural example of the Chicada that uh, there is uh, probably a size effect and probably a sh maybe a shape effect. And we want to, to, to understand that um, uh, quantitatively. And so the first thing we must build is an experiment where we control what's happening. The difficulty in this field is the fact that we try something and it works uh, more or less, and it's, it's not so easy to, 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 to build some metrics. And so I'm going to tell you uh, what we did. And what we did is related to the very first experiment I showed, where you use a tilted plate, what I like to call the Galilean experiment. So what Timothée Mouter did is to take a tilted plate like this, and you deposit a drop, and this plate <clears throat> is made of a very hydrophobic material. Okay, and when you do that, uh, it detaches uh, when it is small, the adhesion is very, very low. I did not put the scale, but from the shape of the drop, you can guess that it's about, uh, let's say, one millimeter. And then the control parameter you have to make due is the temperature of the drop. And so I call delta T the difference of temperature between the drop and the solid. So the solid is, let's say, at 20 degrees. And now I'm going to make a drop which is at 35 degrees. It's not a big difference. However, I expect that when the liquid is uh, warmer, uh, I, will, I should favor condensation. And so uh, I will see if my uh, surface is anti-fogging or not anti-fogging uh, from the size at which, at which it detaches. So you see, I have a, a measurement of the adhesion force here. Uh, and I have also a control on the dew uh, by uh, fixing this delta T. And when you do this experiment, the contrast is very, very high. You have a baby drop here, and here you make a monster, okay? It's very, very big, despite the very small difference of temperature. Immediately, as soon as you have dew, you have a very big sticking effect. So just to give you orders of magnitude, the weight of this drop is 100 times the weight of this one. So this means that we, uh, we multiply the adhesion force by a factor which is 100. Good. If now I look at impact, so impact at the same temperature or impact of a drop which is slightly warmer. Well, we saw that earlier. Uh, we are on a very hydrophobic solid, so it, it nicely bounces. And if the drop is warmer, uh, we induce a very uh, efficient sticking and uh, we lost completely, we killed uh, the, the, the effect. So we reached the same conclusion. Good. So how does it work? Well, this is a very sim simplified view we can have. You have a solid, you have a texture, uh, temperature of that is fixed at, uh, let's say, 20 degrees, and a liquid is coming, which is water, and the temperature of this liquid is slightly larger by a quantity delta T, and so you expect dew to form, and so this is a little drop of dew, and it grows. It grows in this kind of cage, which is here, which is a tiny cage, typical size can be 10 micrometers, so it should grow quickly and uh, so that you connect uh, the uh, liquid uh, to the texture. And so this is what I would like to call an adhesive point, a point of glue. And so uh, of course the final adhesion will depend on the number of points of glue that you will uh, put between the solid and the liquid. Uh, seen from the top now, instead of being seen from the side, uh, this is one case where the number of initial nuclei of water is such that the probability to find in a cage one little drop is smaller than unity. So this corresponds to a small delta t in my former language, uh, uh, only a little bit of dew. And so later, uh, this is a situation that we have, and we can count the number of uh, points of, of glue. And of course, if delta T is much larger, if we have much more dew, then we will have uh, a probability equal or very close to one to find at least one nucleus of water inside a cage, so that later it will be fully blue 
and this is the maximum 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 adhesion that that we can generate uh, uh, um, by uh, by the the, the, the dew. Of course, it's a very large quantity, as we saw in, in the movie, because uh, now my solid has been made hydrophilic by this. It, it, it is supposed to be hydrophobic, even super hydrophobic, but obviously it became hydrophilic. So uh, again, back to the side, we can say very, very simple things. We start with some density uh, uh, of nucle nuclei, and this density should be uh, an increasing function of the intensity of the fog, which is delta t. Here, I gave a very typical value, which might correspond to a delta, delta t of uh, 10 degrees, maybe. These drops are not on a, on, a, on a flat solid. They are on a textured solid, so in the little cages. And you will probably agree that if the typical size of the cage is L, the surface area of the cage is L squared. Okay? And uh, well, L is the size, and we are looking for a size effect. So uh, we guess that the fact that uh, uh, very naturally L square enters uh, might imply a big effect of the size. Indeed, if we multiply uh, D by A, we get the probability P to find a nucleus in a cage. Um, and uh, D is a function of delta T. So a small delta T P should be smaller than unity. And, uh, uh, of course, this increases with uh, delta t. And so from that, later, we made the what I call the points of glue. Okay, And we can evaluate in a very, very rough way. I'm sorry for people who would be a bit delicate uh, from the <laughs> uh, very sensitive to the uh, detail of a model. We just say that the adhesion force is surface tension times a fraction of the perimeter that meets a point of glue. And so uh, this is just PR, but what I just want to mention is two things which are very important. The first thing is that we expect that it depends on the intensity of the fog, because if delta T is larger, P is larger, and so F is larger, more adhesion, first thing. But we mainly expect a size effect. Um, it's, it's embarrassingly simple. The fact that we have L square here, and so F, uh, when we decrease L, should decrease a lot. Okay, so we expect an anti-fogging effect, and the reason, the physical reason, is the miniaturization of the cages. The cages are, are smaller and smaller, and so as a consequence, we should reduce the addition. And so this is something, of course, we can check. So previously, I showed you a texture where L was one micrometer, okay? And now there is a factor 10, which is a factor 100 on, on, on L squared. And so it's a, it's a big difference. And so we look at the rebound of two drops, which are uh, warmer than the, than the solid. And uh, on the right, uh, as we saw earlier, it sticks. On the left, when everything is the same except the size of the, of the, of the texture, it bounces. OK, so uh, we have here a way to repel hot water, you can say, uh, or to minimize the uh, fogging effect. Uh, because we reduce the size of the, of the texture. And so this is the first way to understand that the size matters. We can see that also on the uh, other experiment. Uh, there is a comparison here between the texture which is 100 nanometers in size and the texture which is one micrometer in size. Okay, and so uh, this is something uh, we saw earlier. And you see there is no difference between the two movies. So the water repellency, uh, does not depend really on the size of the of the material. But now the drop is is warmer, and you remember here it was a monster drop, and here it detaches very very easily. If you look very carefully, you will notice that this drop is slightly larger than this one. So there is uh, obviously some fog. There is obviously a little bit of adhesion, but uh, it's relatively marginal compared to the case which is here. And so you can measure this adhesion induced by the dew as a function of delta t. And when you do that, very naturally, you find that this force of adhesion increases with delta t, because of course, when you increase delta t, you have more and more uh, points of glue. And so you increase the adhesion. So this is made on these nanopillars, 100 nanometers. But there is now the shape effect, you remember? We said maybe there is a size effect. 
but we could also think of a, of a shape effect. And if you make a conical surface, which Antonio Keiko did for us uh, at Brookhaven, uh, which has exactly the same characteristics as this one, except that the pillars are conical instead of being cylindrical, and you do the same experiment, you do not measure any force. Uh, at least the, the, the device we have is not sensitive enough to, to report any increase of adhesion. So it means that you have two successive effects. The size effect is an interesting one, but you amplify a lot this size effect by your shape effect. And the explanation we could have for that is uh, maybe a bit naive, but uh, it's natural. It is to say that if you take these surfaces and you place a nucleus of water inside, uh, um, in contrast with what you could observe with uh, cylindrical pillars, there is a Laplace force uh, which tends to push this nucleus out of the, of the, of the texture and to bring you to the uh, acrobatic state. <laughs> the word acrobat, as you know, comes from acron and batain, which means to walk on the tops. And so this is exactly what we expect. Do not think that this is a departure. Uh, we are at a scale which is such, so small that you expect everything to be very viscous, but the size is very small. So everything is quick also, it's viscous, it's slow and quick uh, at the same time because the distances are very small, but you expect this nucleus to be at the top. And if you do that, you kill the idea of the points of glue, which is uh, exactly what we see. I would dream of seeing that, but you see the scale, the time scale makes all of that very difficult to do. The only thing you can do, uh, but uh, the result is interesting, is to take such a surface and to place this surface at four or five degrees and to look at the condensation of the atmosphere, okay, the water from the atmosphere, but in a scanning uh, 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 electron microscope. And if you do that, you find something which is relatively, I think, extraordinary, which is that at a scale, which is 10 micrometers, okay, or even less, all drops are quasi-spherical, okay? So this is fabulous because it means that indeed, when you are on these nano-conical surfaces, then you generate something which seems to be a very suspended state at a very small scale, which was a challenge, of course. The challenge was to, 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 to keep a very high degree of high, hydrophobicity at a scale where generally you do something which is a bit uh, discouraging. And when you look at that, of course, you are tempted to say, well, these drops should be very mobile. And so they grow. And when they coalesce, there is some hope to see them uh, taking take, take off with a large uh, probability. And so this is a comparison between pillars and cones, it's a top view again. And so you are going to see these nuclei and they are growing and they are coalescing. And it's a comparison between these two nano textured surface where the only difference is the shape of the texture. And when you do that, the beginning looks relatively similar. Look on the, on the left, uh, you see they are coalescing and they make a bigger one. They never depart, okay? While here, it's somehow sparkling, we could say. Uh, and you see, if you look, nearly systematically, when two drops are coalescing, they leave. The probability of leaving after a coalescence is 90%, okay? And the fact that it is 90% uh, has to do with the fact that you have asymmetric coalescences, a very little one joining a big one. And of course, it does not bring enough energy to make departure. If now you look at this probability with drops which have comparable sizes, then this probability for uh, two drops of the same size coalescing is nearly 100%. Uh, so it's amazingly efficient as an anti-fogging surface, except if you reduce the size of the drops. When the size of the drop becomes on the order of 1.5 micrometers, then you kill the effect. And probably you kill the effect because there is a little bit of penetration of the liquid at this size inside the texture, and so you induce adhesion. This could be one reason. The other reason is that when you look at viscous effects, they should matter more or less at this scale, okay? And you can vary quite extensively uh, the material. You have different data points here, but the curve is universal. H, 
means, means homothetic. So you take the cones and you multiply the size by some factor, which can be up to two, and you find the same curve. E means extruded. So you keep the distance between pillars the same, and you make the cones longer and longer by a factor which is uh, free in this particular case. All the sizes being on the order of 100 nanometers. And you observe something which is universal. So uh, it means that you found probably here some kind of optimum in the anti-fogging uh, uh, effect. And I would like to finish by looking at two little variations on that. So the first one is very natural. We saw a big difference, a big contrast between pillars and cones. And so there is something which is somehow intermediate between pillars and cones, which is a case of truncated cones, which can be done. And uh, Ioannis uh, Papa Constantinou provided very, very nice samples. Uh, he, he provided also the extruded ones in the previous slide, actually. Uh, but he, he was able to make truncated cones. And uh, these are very interesting objects because they have something of the cones. So for instance, what, what I said about the nucleus uh, should go out. However, there, there are some tops. And because you have tops, you have the possibility of pinning. So what's happening on that? Uh, first, when you look at the drops, they are, they are decently spherical, we could say. However, they, they have some contact now a little bit, okay? And so this has to do with the fact, of course, that uh, we have tops, and so we have more interaction with the solid. We have pinning also. And when you look at the so-called contact angle hysteresis, it is 30 degrees instead of less than 10 degrees on the cones. And it's comparable to the contact angle hysteresis on the pillars. So this is a measurement of the adhesion. And when you look at the coalescence, there are some departures, but now the number, instead of being 90%, is 8%. So it looks very disappointing. However, it is not so disappointing. When you compare views, top views, you see a kind of paradox here. After some time, 30 minutes, yes, we can say that we have slightly larger drops on the truncated cones, but not, not at all like on the pillars. And the reason is that there is an anti-fogging effect, which is relatively efficient, actually, but it's not exactly the same scenario. It has to do with the fact that when two drops are meeting, n equal to, this is the number of drops in a coalescence, we have a strictly zero departure rate. And this is a cause of the low, the poor performance, 8%. However, when we have three drops meeting, four drops meeting, then we have a high degree of departure. And we think that the reason is just the fact that uh, uh, you inject more energy. Of course, when you transform three, four drops in one drop, you uh, gain more surface energy than when you have only two drops. And so this might be the reason why suddenly uh, they depart efficiently. And as a consequence, water does not accumulate uh, for a reason which is slightly different from what we saw earlier. And to finish, a uh, second variation on these cones, we saw uh, that we had a size effect plus a shape effect. So now I keep the shape effect and I change the size. Okay, And this is something we constructed with Guy Luke from Thales uh, Industry. So they built for us fabulous samples where now the cones are, let's say, about one micrometer. And there is some variations, as you can see. The scale is the same, and so you have relatively large cones here, but very big cones at the scale of one micrometer. And so the question is, uh, now it's so large, but do we still have anti-fogging? Uh, do we keep this uh, wonderful property? Said differently, does the shape, the conical shape, uh, so robust for the anti-fogging that we keep something, or is it different? So the first thing you do is to do a direct observation. Uh, and so you, again, it's always the same experiment. You, you cool a little bit your surface. You look at the drops which are forming from the atmosphere. And what you find is something uh, which is uh, quite funny. Uh, and this was our first hope to say, now it's big enough that when we look, we see everything. In particular, we see below. And so we can see things that we could not see. So we use these cones as a magnification tool for seeing what's happening at the scale of the texture. But it seems that it's not exactly the same experiment. Changing the size seems to change the shape. And now we have something which is a little bit like a, 
hot air balloon. Okay, uh, this is uh, the balloon part here. But we we guess that there is here uh, the basket of the balloon, which is trapped inside the, the texture. And this this is a very interesting object. Remember at the beginning I said, well, we have two states: either uh, the acrobatic state, which is at the top of the texture, or the state which is inside, which is pinned. And here we have something which is both. Uh, we have the basket which is spin and we have the rest which is acrobatic. And so what, what is the winner here? Uh, what, what, what's happening in particular when two drops uh, are coalescing? Well, when two drops are coalescing uh, uh, and we look at the success of the part, so this is the performance of the anti-fogging material, the probability that two drops are living, the black points are the nanoscopic texture we saw, so fabulous texture, and the micrometric ones, as you can see, are, uh, are a bit different. Uh, when the drop is small, nothing happens, and when the drop is large enough, you can reach a very high degree of, of, of depart. And so now, uh, the typical size at which you have a transition between nothing happens and nearly everybody departs, uh, is uh, shifted, and this shift depends on the on the size of the of the texture. The size being here the distance between the cones, but everything is homotetic, so you have only one distance in this particular case. So why is it like that? Well, we think because of the basket precisely. Uh, these these are top views, and uh, these drops are coalescing, so there is some energy to gain, which is the energy surface energy due to the coalescence of the balloons. However, after the depart, the departure, you see that something remains, which is a basket. The basket was spin. And so you have to cut. You have to cut the basket from the balloon. And so it has a price, which is related to the size of the cones. And so you immediately guess that it will jump only if the uh, negative term is larger than the positive term. And so uh, uh, it tells you that uh, the size must be larger than there is a mistake here, and something which is L, uh, a few times L, which is uh, the typical uh, uh, size of your, of your codes. So with this very modest equation, or inequation, which is even wrong because I did a mistake on the symbol here, uh, I think uh, I can leave you and I would be very, very happy to take a, a few questions if you, if you have any. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for the great talk. So uh, it's time for questions. So as always, if you have questions, please raise your hand in the uh, uh, in the chat. Or in yeah. No worries. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Then what is it? No, no. I was saying that people can actually raise hand in the in the chat. Ah, okay. <laughs> this is about about the impossible love between an aquatic spider and a uh, uh, water strider. Um, one at the surface, one in the bulk, they cannot meet. So sad. Uh, it's related to the uh, viscous effect that you showed in the very early part of the talk. Mm -hmm. the three droplets with three different viscosity, but the behavior was pretty much the same. Uh, and basically the message I think was that the viscosity doesn't matter. Uh, is that the case? I mean, there should be some limit, right? I mean, when viscosity, I mean, asymptotically goes to, let's say, infinity, I mean, there should be a limit that viscosity begins to matter. So what is that limit? Yeah, so, um, so when, you, when you treat this, uh, this, when you try to make a, a very simple model for that, you are tempted to use a spring equation where the stiffness of the spring is a surface tension of the liquid which by the way is expressed in Newton per meter. So it has indeed the units of a stiffness. And so when you write this equation, you, you assume that uh, two bounds is equivalent to, um, to distort a spring. And it looks like that because you indeed, you, you place your uh, kinetic energy in surface energy, and then you recover at least part of it uh, in kinetic energy. And so uh, you can introduce a damping term, which is related to the viscosity. And the beauty of that is you get a very well-defined time, which is the response time of the spring, 
-hmm. and you get a damping term, which is the so-called owner's organ number. And so this owner's organ number, when everything is made without dimension, uh, is mainly um, uh, tuned by the viscosity because the viscosity has a power one, the owner's organ number, while the other parameters, which are surface tension, density, and uh, radius of the drop, has a power which is um, uh, one half only. And so, uh, as you said, uh, if you increase more and more the viscosity, you increase more and more the action of this damping term. And at some point, it becomes a little bit like having a spring in Honey. Uh, it will not oscillate. Okay. And so you can define and even model and even calculate the limit in, in, in viscosity. And when you, uh, when you do this very, very simple argument, you find that the limited viscosity should be on the order of 200 millipascals, which is exactly what we see in this movie, where you see here, um, for this viscosity, uh, it nearly bounces, but we are clearly at the limit. And if you take a larger viscosity, then of course, nothing like that will happen. So there is a cutoff, which is very well defined. It is expressed here as a function of the viscosity, it could be expressed also as a function of the size of the drop, obviously. The smaller the size, of course, the larger the viscosity. Have you looked into non-Newtonian fluids? Yes. Uh, a little bit. We, uh, well, I don't know. The question is very large because uh, I, I, I showed many effects. So I don't know which one. If, it, if you think about the bouncing effect, for instance, some colleagues did that. And there are uh, very interesting effects there are a lot of debates also, uh, in particular, when you look at the effect of uh, long polymers, for instance. Uh, there is a very famous article by uh, Vance Bergeron, uh, published in uh, 2000, so 20 years ago, where they see anti-bouncing effect when you, when you, when you use large um, uh, polymeric molecules. This is, uh, uh, the effect is, is, is uh, absolutely uh, obvious, uh, no doubt. Uh, but the interpretation of this effect uh, 20 years after uh, is still under debate. And so, yeah, the question of, of uh, at large, I would say, the question of uh, non-Newtonian liquids is, 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 is uh, extremely interesting. We, we hardly, uh, we, we, did not, we did not really perform any uh, significant experiments in this field, but I am a big fan of people who did that. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next question comes from Zach uh, Kujala. Uh, for the case where you have bouncing droplets and the temperature difference, uh, do you think that having a surfactant in the liquid would prevent the dew drops from coalescing with, uh, with and gluing the bouncing drop? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very specialized question. So uh, the, the question is related to this experiment where you, you do an impact with differences of temperature. And you remember when there is no difference of temperature, it nicely bounces. When there is a difference of temperature, we induce adhesion because we think of the uh, little points of glue that we make. And so if now, in addition to that, we have a surfactant, the first question would be, uh, what is the effect of the surfactant in this case first? And this is a very interesting question because you, you deform a lot the, the liquid. And so two cases, either the surfactant can follow the deformation or it cannot. And so you can also induce sticking transition just due to the surfactant. And so now if you add surfactant plus temperature, <laughs> I think uh, it's a bit early to answer. But uh, my feeling is that a surfactant does not prevent really evaporation. Uh, it, it decreases a little bit evaporation, but I think it should not prevent the formation of the dew. I see. Uh, Tim Petley asks, can anti-fogging uh, anti surface be made sufficiently robust for commercial uh, use? Yeah, it's a, it's a painful question. And uh, I, uh, this is exactly what I expected from Tim. Uh, 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 well, you saw the name of a company, so it's a good sign. They are interested in that. And uh, when you see the, how delicate are these cones, you can be very, very uh, um, pessimistic about the fact that when you, we put our fingers on, on them, uh, we should destroy everything. I, I would like to say two things. The first thing is that these conical surfaces, uh, these conical structures, at the scale where we consider them, which is uh, 50 nanometers, 100 nanometers, are not only 
anti-fogging and water repellent, they are also extraordinary anti-reflective. And so this is the reason why, the main reason why the cicada uh, coated its wings with these uh, uh, devices. It is to be as transparent as possible to hide on the trunks, okay? Uh, and so uh, the fact that you have this double functionality is of course another source of stimulation for the, um, uh, for the applications. So uh, there are cases where uh, we can be relatively optimistic uh, for very sophisticated devices which are not too exposed to uh, our fingers, for instance. Uh, there are some prototypes and they are very promising, but these are very uh, high added values uh, products. Um, the fact that truncated cones have interesting anti-fogging effect is obviously a big step towards applications because then they are very resistant, much more. And they are resistant for two reasons. First, because they are not sharp, this is obvious, but also because the, the size is very small. It's not so easy to destroy something which is at the size of 100 nanometers. Okay, so uh, I'm not fully pessimistic about applications. Uh, uh, of course, anti-reflective properties are, are not as good as the ones for elongated cones, but uh, maybe there is a possibility of a compromise. So um, there's one question from Shaoyi Hu, uh, says, thanks a lot for the inspiring talk. What if inverse all the posts into holes? In that case, air will be trapped inside holes and wetting transition will be in there. Yeah, so, um, so it's not easy to do that. Um, the reason is that uh, it's, a, it's a very good question and, and, uh, and uh, we thought a lot of, we had a lot of hope in, 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 this, in this kind of possibilities. But when you, uh, when you come back to this very, very first slide maybe uh, where I had a very naive sketch, um, where is it? Where you look at the texture, yeah, this one. So to dig holes, uh, if you think of that geometrically, uh, it's extremely difficult to have here a solid fraction, what we call the solid fraction, which is the one which is actually in contact with the liquid, which I said maybe 10% very typically. Uh, it's very, very difficult to go to such a small number when you make holes. This fraction is much, much larger. And so as a consequence, these surfaces are uh, highly adhesive generally compared to these ones, okay? So uh, holes, uh, but at some point there is some ambiguity. These are very, these are model textures. And now if you build uh, a texture which is very disordered with colloids, uh, which is a commercial product you can find, then uh, we can say that they are made of peaks, but we can also say that they are made of holes. They are even somehow porous. And so then the, the, I agree that the holes uh, can be a kind of solution. So it depends a little bit on the, on the kind of texture you are looking at. Uh, next question is from Jerome Nofield. Uh, he has given how sensitive the pro properties are to temperature and to surface morphology. Can you induce transport of droplets with either a gradient in temperature or surface texture, post spacing, geometry, etc.? Uh, I don't know what is the question exactly. So maybe the question is uh, if I start from this state. Um, and uh, uh, the, the question could be, uh, what are the, the ways to induce self-transportation, which is a very interesting uh, topic in itself, self-propelling drops, so tricks. Um, and uh, 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 I think the main question was about uh, placing a gradient in, of temperature here. Mm -hmm. So generally, when you place a gradient of temperature on a solid, you can induce a motion of the liquid which is placed on this solid. And I would say very generally, uh, drops go, go, go to the cold <laughs> for a reason which have to do with uh, surface tension. Uh, it's a bit complicated to be completely general because you have uh, three kinds of surface tension, solid liquid, solid air, and liquid air. And so it can depend a little bit on the detail of, of, of that. But Obviously, when you move the drop to, let's say, either hot or cold, you change these surface energies. Mm -hmm. It's not a big change. So first, it's not so easy to achieve practically, but it was done and many people looked at that. And uh, when you go to these situations, you have two effects which are somehow antagonistic. The first one 
is that you reduce a lot the adhesion and the friction. So this is very good. It should be easy and quick. So this is nice. However, you reduce the contact. And because with a gradient of temperature, everything occurs by the contact, uh, you reduce the effect. And so to the best of my knowledge, I think there is no achievement of displacing such a drop on a gradient of temperature. Next question comes from Jonathan Gitson Danner. Uh, Jonathan asks, when we have the hot air balloon shape uh, with the large cones, what caused the continuity of shape across the cones? I'm a first year undergrad, so I'm not have gotten there in my coursework. Uh, yeah, so what, is, I'm sorry, I, I, did not, I did not understand the question itself. The question is about the hot air balloon shape. Ah, the, okay, yeah, uh, okay. What caused the continuity of the shape across the cones? I guess it's... Yeah, it's no, it's a, it's a good question. Um, uh, I'm surprised that he had no course about uh, condensation in uh, micro cones, but uh, it can happen. Um, uh, so um, uh, the hot balloon is here. First, it's not so clear, but uh, we, we have this idea, which is there, and this grew, this started from a nucleus, okay, and the nucleus generally seems to be inside the cones, just because there are many reasons for that, but the, the, very, the top is very sharp, and so it's not favorable to make a drop at the, at the top. Also, maybe, uh, it's, a, it's a bit a trivial effect, but I think it's, uh, it's also nice to see that uh, we can say trivial things, uh, when you place the surface at four degrees, it's not completely obvious that the top is also at four degrees, in particular when the cones are large. So you expect the tops to be uh, warmer. And so condensation is probably favored inside the cones. And so as a consequence, you expect the nucleus to be inside the cones, and from there it grows. So it's a balloon which starts from the basket, okay? The basket first, and so the balloon after. Uh, fortunately, the balloon, the hot air balloon, did what we expect from a hot air balloon, as you remember, it, it went, it departed. Uh, but we keep the continuity because probably the size now is large, and so the sticking effect of the basket is, is, is large enough to keep the basket. So I have a little simulation here. The first time in my life I show a simulation because uh, this is a result, the sad result of confinement. We were forced with Krishan Buma to do simulation with surface evolver. And you are going to see a nucleus growing uh, in an assembly of cones. And the nice thing is that you, you indeed, you generate the, the, the balloon thing. But the, uh, of course, the interesting fact is that this liquid does not go laterally, okay? And the reason is that when you look at the energy to cross the boundary between the pillars, it's a, it, there is a serious penalty here. And so the natural way to escape is from the top, which is fortunate because of course, if we propagate the basket along the cones with many baskets now, uh, we will keep, of course, trapped these drops. If we want an anti-fogging effect, we must have either the drops at the top or let's say at most one basket. Perfect. I was a bit long, but uh, I think uh, I was so, I'm so proud to show something which is a numerical, so <laughs> it's a very simple thing, of course, but... Uh... Fact, there was a question in the chat from uh, Carlos Escalante about the numerical simulations, and he asked if you could elaborate a bit on that. Carlos, if you have more questions on that, maybe write in the chat, and hopefully... Yeah, I saw a splendid simulation, so I'm very happy to say we did a lot of that, so... Uh, <laughs> no, uh, uh, this is a very good question because uh, simulations, uh, of, of course, are very useful at the scale that I considered. You see, the scale of these cones, which is 100 nanometers, uh, of course, remains supramolecular, but it's a very good scale for simulations. And uh, there are a lot of thoughts about uh, what is the effect of um, the, the, the shape of these objects just on the nucleation itself. For instance, there is a detail here, which I, I find very interesting, which is the very beginning of this movie where we compare condensation of, on nanopillars and nanocones. Just the very beginning here. Obviously, the density is much larger. And there is a factor, which is a factor five. It's a big effect. So if I am very optimistic, I could say these surfaces are indeed fabulous because they, they have departure, 
but they have much less nucleus, which is a genuine antifogging effect. Of course, the ideal case would be zero nucleus, <laughs> but we have condensation, but much less than on the other uh, solid. And so the effect of the tip, uh, all of that should be explored. And um, I think that the simulations should bring a lot, and they did already. There are a few interesting thoughts about the effect of the top curvature, for instance, which is not uh, favorable to condensation. So Jo asks, uh, or says, thanks for the great talk. Is there any room for improvement for developing anti-folding surfaces given the cone shape gives the best performance? I mean, if I interpret it. Yeah, I, I understand the question. It's, a, it's, a, it's an embarrassing question because I, I, I would not like to claim that we, 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 we by, by, nearly by accident, we found the, the best surface. It, 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 this doesn't mean anything. I, I would, maybe I would like to have a very general answer because uh, what, it, it, it's not a question of being the best surface or not. It's a question that when we look at the interaction of uh, uh, small drops with small texture, um, uh, there is a huge variety of things. And uh, what we explored is extremely small in a sense. Uh, it's a particular shape. And so uh, because we have shape effects, we are very curious of developing uh, other kinds of, of, uh, of shapes to understand um, deeper uh, the kind of effects, uh, of course, beyond anti-fogging that we, that, that we could generate. Uh, when we look at the texture in the natural world, for instance, we are amazed by the variety of these, of the shapes precisely. Uh, the, the sizes also, but mostly the, 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 the shapes. I showed a few examples and uh, we need to understand that. So uh, uh, beyond anti-fogging, uh, understanding the interaction of tiny drops with uh, uh, even tinier uh, texture is, is, a, is a beautiful uh, program of research. Do you think this effect can be used for propulsion? Um, propulsion of what? Yeah, I'm not sure which yeah. effect. What... It is propulsion, okay? Uh, when the drops are leaving, uh, maybe I have a movie somewhere. Charles Coin did a movie of that. Uh, yeah, this is a movie of, so, ah, no, maybe, I don't know if it works. No, it's an old uh, movie, maybe this one, no, it's not. These are side views. These are supposed to be side views of uh, two drops coalescing and then propelling. So this is propulsion, but it's a, it's a tiny thing, you know, the energy is, is nearly nothing. So uh, I, I'm not very optimistic for propelling objects with these, uh, these, the only thing they propel is themselves, which is not bad because we want to get rid of them. So we are happy of that. But propelling an object, for instance, we would put on these surfaces, um, it could happen. Uh, Chua Hua Chen made very beautiful movies where he looked at what's happening when you place some dust on uh, surfaces where you have this jumping effect. And the very nice thing is that, uh, well, uh, drops of condensation uh, grow, coalesce, jump, and take the dust with them. So uh, dew cleans the uh, plant, for instance, uh, or the insect. And uh, uh, for me, there is a, a, obviously a mystery to understand why the cicada would need an anti-fogging wing uh, while it's living mostly in, in hot places. Uh, there are maybe two reasons. One is if there is dew, suddenly the wing becomes opaque and it becomes visible. And the idea which is defended by uh, Chihuahua is a bit different. It is to say there is uh, very often a little bit of dew in the early morning. So probability of finding predators is relatively low at this time, they are sleeping probably. Uh, however, uh, uh, Chikada can use that to clean their wings. Uh, they, they are self-cleaning in a sense by the dew. And so, uh, yeah, uh, finally I answer, it's a, it's a, it's a very good uh, idea. You can use this uh, effect to propel tiny objects, such as uh, the dust you would have on, 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 on the wings if you are a Chikada. Perfect. Uh, next question from Carl uh, says, is there an experiment that you would do if you were not limited to uh, terrestrial capillarity or capillary length scales, where, for instance, you could have good optics between conical pillars? 
uh, yeah, good optics. Uh, this is uh, probably something I mentioned earlier, the fact that these surfaces are, uh, are anti-reflective, okay? And so uh, if you think of the optics of um, a camera, for instance, uh, the fact that they are anti-reflective increases the transmission of light. And so your camera is more sensitive, for instance. So uh, it's, it's protected against you, but uh, also uh, it is more sensitive. So this question of double functionality uh, is something which is uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, very uh, exciting because you, you work a lot to build your cones, but you gain, uh, you gain, uh, you gain a lot uh, as well. Okay. I think his question was that if, if you were not limited in, in that, uh, if you could go to the length of scale that you could do those experiments, uh, is there any experiments that you would like to do? Uh, not limited by the scale. So going to the space, for instance. So I guess that's a question. Yeah, so having uh, cones which are like this and in the space with a drop, which is like that and saying all what I, I showed you, but uh, uh, yeah, I would be happy of that. I'm a bit, I'm not, uh, of course, I, I admire a lot of people who are uh, courageous enough to go to the space and so on. So no doubt about that. Uh, but, um, uh, well, uh, zero gravity experiments are very heavy and costly. And so um, I, I must confess it's not fully my style. So, but maybe we could do that. Uh, no, maybe we could do that by getting rid of gravity uh, on the earth by uh, matching, uh, matching the viscosities of two liquids uh, instead of air and going back to the plateau experiment, but uh, doing uh, this, this, this is certainly feasible. Yeah, and it's a good idea. Um, you, build a, you build a solid where now your cones are millimetric, let's say. Um, capillary lengths in a mixture of oil and water can be a few centimeters easily. And so it would be it would be interesting and funny to see all these phenomena at a very large scale. Yeah, this is a, this is a, this is a good idea. Great. Uh, the next question is unfortunately I cannot see from who, but the question is uh, regarding anti-fogging surfaces with pillar uh, texture for the same delta T. Have you performed experiments when the water droplets have the same temperature, but the surface was cooled instead? If so, were the reported trends maintained? Uh, no, we we did not do that. Uh, uh, we did not do that. Uh, the reason is that we naively we we wanted to control um, the, the the fogging effect by the temperature of the drop when it contacts the solid, um, and so the assumption is that there is no dew initially, okay? But now if we cool the surface, we'll have a lot of dew and we, it's, it's, it's much more difficult to, to, to know it will grow and so on. So here we assume that everything will come from the hot drop because mm. we are at a temperature where we expect no dew. So it's not absolutely equivalent, I think. And we lose this aim, which was methodologic here. We wanted to build something where we can have quantitative laws and metrics for comparing surfaces and so on, which is not so easy, but it's a, it's a good point. Yeah, I, I see I see the point. Thank you very much for the exciting talk. Considering the case when two droplets coalesce and jump off a surface, could the kinetic energy of the droplet motion when flying be associated with the difference between the total surface energy associated with the surface tension of the two droplets and the final single droplet after merging? <laughs> Yeah, so it's a, it's a good point. Uh, this is something I did not discuss at all, which is uh, what is the velocity of taking off and what is the ballistics after, uh, which are very interesting questions, of course. Uh, if you want to get rid of the dew, uh, it's interesting to know uh, how fast you, and this has to do with this uh, little picture. Uh, if you assume that your surface energy is fully transferred in kinetic energy, you find a law which is, uh, relatively trivial. Uh, and this law is very strange because the smaller the drop, the larger the velocity, which is logical because of course uh, the, the mass is very sensitive to the, to the size, the cube of the size. And so you are not fully surprised of that, but we are not used to the fact that objects are quicker when they are small, in particular when they are very small because viscosity in principle um, says the contrary. So this law is 
curiously true at the scale of very small scale, 5, 10, 20 micrometers. Okay, your velocity decreases and the scaling law which is here is the one which is observed. However, the number which is in front, uh, I love scaling laws, but sometimes we care about the, num the numbers, the coefficients, and the number is off by a factor of five. Okay, and this number is extremely easy to predict because you know exactly the energy which is gained and you know exactly the formula for the kinetic energy. So all of that is, is absolutely trivial. And uh, it has to do with the fact that these systems, uh, although they look very simple, have some, uh, so to speak, internal source of, of dissipation. And so uh, it's not absolutely equivalent to apply uh, conservation of energy, as I did here naively, and mm -hmm. conservation of momentum. And when you, when you apply conserv conservation of momentum, uh, uh, which uh, Pierre Lecointre and Timothée Mouter did, um, you find the proper coefficient, which is 0.2 instead of being one, uh, around one when it's uh, conservation of energy. So this is a very good point. There is some subtlety if you want to understand uh, what is uh, the speed of, uh, of taking off uh, in the model and just saying conservation of energy is not enough. Thanks for the interesting talk. What is your take on fog capture through engineered vetability gradient surfaces and how far can it be commercially viable? Uh, so Manoj Shuduri in Lehigh, at Lehigh, did a lot on that, and he, he, he performed wonderful experiments where you, 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 you capture. Uh, so I, uh, maybe I could say more generally, here I insisted on a strategy which is to get rid of the dew at its, as it forms. Okay, but there is another possibility which is completely different, which is to guide the dew and to. Uh, to uh, accumulate the dew. Uh, and if you do that, at some point, you will make drops which are so large that they will go uh, by gravity, for instance. Okay, so uh, what uh, Manoy did was to build um, a gradients of uh, hydrophilicity, and so the drop will move independently of gravity uh, at the scale of these dew drops, so this is uh, nearly obvious, to regions which are more hydrophilic. And so uh, these are obviously very, very clever uh, experiments. Uh, if I had to bet on what could be the best strategy to get rid of dew, <laughs> I don't know. There is a very, very trivial strategy, which is completely different. And you can think of that in a car, for instance, which is to have a solid, uh, which is uh, extremely hydrophilic. Then your liquid is coming and it spreads completely and you don't care about it because after all the quantity of liquid, is, is, a, is a very small quantity. You can think of a polymer, for instance, that you place on, on, on the surface and it swells a little bit because of, of this water and this, this works wonderfully. And so it's more a chemical approach, uh, which is, uh, I think in some cases, a perfect one. Uh, it's about the movie you showed at the very end. And he's asking which movie of Miyazaki is that one? Yeah, so Miyazaki, uh, uh, we, many of us, we, we, know, we know him. Uh, many of us, we are big fan of, of, of him. And he made a very, very small movie. So it's not, it's not a well-known movie by Miyazaki. Uh, and my former PhD student, Raphael Tevenin, uh, found this little movie, which is a few minutes only. Uh, and it's about the impossible love between the um, Argironeta Aquatica uh, which is this uh, spider, which takes big bubbles at the surface of, 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 of ponds to build a nest of air uh, under water and, and, uh, and at the geris, and the geris of water strider. And uh, of course, one is using, uh, from my point of view, uh, aerophilicity. And the other one, the water strider, has these legs which are very hydrophobic and it turns out that the legs are decorated with cones, precisely. So this is one example and another example where we find cones at the surface. And I think that these cones are designed to be anti-fogging because uh, at the surface of a pond, of course, you have a lot of vapor. Okay? And if by accident you start to condense the, uh, the vapor in the legs, your legs become hydrophilic. So uh, this is maybe very sad for the water strider, but the end of the story for Miyazaki could be different because now your water strider is hydrophilic, so it sinks. Unfortunately, 
it finds an air nest built by Argironeta and they can live forever uh, in this uh, paradise. <laughs>